From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Vitamin Energy. The Vitamins. The Energy. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! It's Wake Up Warchant, presented by Vitamin Energy, coming up on today's show. It's a really short one. We're just previewing the Knolls taking on the Vols tonight at 7 o'clock. We talk with Eric Kane from VolQuest. Wake up, WarChamp, presented by Vitamin Energy, vitaminenergy.com. Promo code WarChamp, BOGO, WarChamp, B-O-G-O. Also, check out our good friends over at Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, 2475 Appalachie Parkway. Daily lunch specials, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., only $8.99. Uh, sorry for all the commercials at the beginning of the show, and then only about 15 minutes of meat on the bone here, but... Um, there really wasn't anything else going on. Didn't really didn't feel like forcing the football. I get it, everybody. Uh, but at the same time, it's this is what we all got to rally around, everybody. Go listen to Link's interview. Go check out our YouTube page. Shout out to our guy Ben Spicer. Broke out some of the more interesting bits from the press conference yesterday. But to hear Link Jarrett talk about what Mike Martin meant to him, what winning a national title would mean to this baseball team. I'm sorry, but I just I can't get too worried about who's going to be our number three wide receiver right now. I get it. That's what that's what we all are going to be worried about in like a month. But right now, man, we got to figure out a way, everybody, to get on the same page with this um, and embrace baseball. Not a big baseball guy, but this is an incredible story. The fact that this program has been in Omaha 23 times and has never won it all. Have you done anything in your life that you've cared about and loved 23 times and come up short every single time? I mean, Link Jarrett hasn't come up short 23 times. Mike Martin didn't come up short 23 times. But this program, in some way, shape, or form, people that wore this jersey, went to this school, lived in this town, have tried so hard every single year to be that team. I don't know, man. I think it's profound. But... um, I can't bring you with me, everybody. I wish I could, but hopefully something resonated in that two-minute soliloquy. Nonetheless, this is all the show is. It's me and Eric came from VolQuest talking about the game. Enjoy. Not sure if this is going to be part of a full podcast, everybody. We're just going to break it out and make it part of our bonanza preview when it comes to the College World Series. Our own Irish show fell out there in Omaha. But in the meantime, something to tide you over. we got Eric Kane over here from VolQuest. Uh, they're the leading Tennessee website in all the land. And they're on the On3 Network. Eric, how are you, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Uh, let's jump into this. Um, I, I, you know, I was on your show. Um, I, I'm less of a numbers guy. I'm like more of like an esoteric, really uh, overly deep when it comes to simple things like sports. So bear with me here. But just <laughs> like listening to Tony Vitello on Thursday and in the, in the press conference before they square off against Florida State on Friday, like, I know he's got a reputation, maybe a little, runs a little bit hot, but you can't argue against the results, obviously, that he's accomplished at Tennessee in such a short amount of time. He's got to be one of the most beloved coaches in all the country. Like, no fan base loves their coach as much as Tennessee loves Tony Vitello, it seems. How, how important of a week is this for him in terms of showing that, like, all the emotion that is so awesome to see on a baseball field when your team is winning can sometimes maybe come and bite you in the butt? How important do you think it is for – I don't want to say legacy or anything like that, but just how important is it for Tony Vitello and maybe this fan base uh, to see this team actually have some success so they they can buy into his vision and his way of running a program truly? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, the, the 2022 team, it, like, it just hangs over every, and it's going to continue to be that way unless this team wins a national championship because of, you know, who they were and, and the, the bad boys of college baseball, the attitude, you know, all that type of stuff. And and sure, I mean, this team is exciting and this team plays with a certain amount of swagger, if you want to call it that. And it's confident and, you know, it gets excited, but it is nowhere close to what that team was. And so, like, so many people just kind of assume Tennessee's that from that 2022 club. And it, it's not all, always the, the, the same team, but, I mean, certainly an exciting team, a passionate team. But for Tony Vitello in particular, you're exactly right, man. And, I mean, Tennessee fans adore him, and like he still doesn't get enough credit, you know, for what he's done here at Tennessee, and that's just wild to say because again, everybody loves him and he's just so adored. But you know what he's accomplished here in, in seven years at the helm, uh, pretty much at the time taking it from ground zero and bringing it up. I mean, there's been some success in the history in the program before, but it's it's it been a minute. 
um just at a phenomenal pace and so but but all that to say i mean this is the third trip to omaha in four years uh for tony vitello and you won one game uh, i'm not saying if you go there and you go o2 barbecue or you know you only win one game it's a failure I'm, i don't believe i don't subscribe into you know championship or bus but it it, it feels especially in this sport but it feels like you need to you need to go ahead and win some more games and make this an extended stay and um it's such an unpredictable, you know, tournament and regional like setup, and then of course you get to a super regional like setup for the final series. I mean, it's tough to do, but you'd, you'd hope that this team that's probably, I mean, I, I don't, it's it's not as dominant on paper as the twenty twenty two team was, but man, it it is so good. Uh, you'd like for you like for it to, see, to be an extended stay and to you know have more than that one win to show for in Omaha. So we'll see what happens, but yeah, he's adored. Um, I think he obviously wants to put some more wins on his resume here at this stage and. I think Tennessee's a really, really good team this year to, to accomplish that. I think beside the statistic that like whatever, 78% of teams that win the first game of the Super Regional end up in Omaha, like maybe the second postseason stat that's blazed in everyone's mind is like the number one overall national seed has not won at all since 1999. Um, I, I'm aware of that. I didn't realize that was something that loomed over programs. Florida State in 2002, 2003, they were the number one overall seed. They did not even make it to Omaha those two years. But in speaking to Tennessee on Thursday, like that, it, that's an actual thing, it seems like. And, and for the players, they admit as much seeing it on social. And then Tony Vitello kind of spun that into terms of, you know, just things that he sees on the Internet, the, the rise of the Internet coincides with 1999 and maybe <laughs> brackets are being made in a way to not help out these teams. I mean, what did you take away from that sort of exchange? Yeah, I mean, it's they, they've been asked about it. Um for I, I guess going on you know three four weekends now you know going back to when Tennessee won the uh, the SEC tournament uh, that Sunday against LSU and was the number one ranked team in the at, at the time and you know all the field of sixty four projections and everything had Tennessee being the number one overall seed entering that day and Tennessee didn't lose so it was expected and assumed that Tennessee was going to be the number one overall seed so there were questions asked in that press conference. There were questions asked a couple of times over regional weekend and then, of course, last weekend in Super. So these players and, and Tony's have to kind of like answer or at least speak on this 99 Miami, the, the number one curse, you know, for about a month now. And so they're very aware of it. And, of course, uh, you know, Tony taking that question and talking about the Internet and talking about this and that is he, he's all over the place sometimes. That, that doesn't shock me at all. But I, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's something that dwells on these guys, but uh, it's something that obviously they are aware of it. Um, certainly back in 2022, that's, you know, just a couple of years ago, some of these guys were on the team then, and, and they were the number one ranked, you know, overall seed at the time as well. So I, I just, I don't think that they worry about it too much. I feel like this is a, and I know everybody can say this about the team they cover or their favorite team or whatever, but this team just feels loose. Um, they were, they were facing elimination the other night against Evansville, obviously biggest game of the year. And then it was very important, but you know, nothing changed for them. They weren't pressing. I mean, I was kind of down there and around it during pregame, and it, it was just normal. They got really good leadership, you know, and Drew Beam, a guy you saw speak earlier today at Media Day, and and Hunter Inslee. So aware of it. Um, we'll see if, you know, if, if, if that continues on this year. But I honestly don't think it's dwelling on them at all because if it was, and they could have backed down and, and lost to a team like Evansville, and that was – Another storyline of a number four seed trying to make you know history again after you know winning the first time ever against the number one overall seed the day before. I feel like if they kind of succumb to that type of pressure, it would have already happened by now. Yeah. All right. So pitching matchup uh, on the forefront of everybody's mind uh, on Wednesday, Link Jared pretty much told us it was going to be Jamie Arnold. Uh, Thursday, he you know backed it up and, and said as much as well too. So Jamie Arnold, the lefty phenom, will start for Florida State on Friday against Tennessee. I know Tennessee has done this this opener kind of thing, Eric, where they you know they piece things together. But what are your thoughts on Chris Stamos? Uh, again, sorry not to be confused with Stamos, everybody. Um, <laughs> but you know, just looking at a guy like AJ Causey, who earlier in the year, you know, at, of his 17 starts, he had 13 wins. I mean, they've they've had several guys that have had quality starts as late as late May out here. Uh, Stamos, I don't think, has gotten more than 10 outs all year long. Uh, what do you kind of piece together? that you think makes it make sense for Tony Vitale and the Vols to, to give Stamos the ball on Friday? Yeah, it's been very, you know, unconventional um, throughout the season. At, at points in times, man, it was like it was an opener on Friday and it was an opener on Sunday. And then, you know, Xander Seacrest, who is pitching arguably better than anybody for Tennessee right now, is kind of, kind of you know, shrugged off that opener stinge. And he, he's kind of been a full-blown starter here the last, 
you know, month or so of the season. But, you know, Stamos is, is, is you know, a crafty lefty. He's a veteran. He doesn't overpower you in any, any way. He locates well. Um, he's a guy that, you know, is, it did this a little bit at Cal before coming to Tennessee, not nearly as much, but, um, just kind of, that, that's where they kind of see that it works the best. And, and, and then you have Causey, AJ Causey's the guy to, you know, the watch, he's going to come in, you know, whether he pitches four five, six innings of relief, he is the guy and he's, he's a sidewinder, you know, kind of a funky arm slot delivery, uh, 91, 92 from that angle is tough against righties, especially with the break of a sinker. Um, really, really good pitcher, and he's been just incredible for Tennessee in his, his only year here since coming over from Jacksonville State. But Tennessee had to do all this because you had A.J. Russell, who had so much hype coming into the season, had 10 strikeouts and four innings in a third in the opener on opening day. He gets hurt in his second start of the season and then tries to come back and gets hurt again. And then ultimately, you, you haven't had your number one starter all year long, so Tennessee's kind of had to piece it together a little bit and didn't want to move Drew Beam off, two, uh, off, the, off the second game and and then they had their own little thing on, on on Sundays as well. So, you know, Frank Anderson, I think this is probably his best pitching job um, at Tennessee. And that's saying a lot because in 2022, you had a newcomer in Chase Dolander. Yes, he became a, a top 10 draft pick, but he was a newcomer. And he had two true freshmen in Chase Burns and Drew Beam. Um, I think the job that he's done this year not only rivals that, but maybe outdoes that. He's been really, really good. So uh, Tony and Frank are both very set in their ways. Um, when it's working, they don't want to change anything up, and that's why you're kind of seeing this kind of come into the College World Series. So expect uh, if everything goes perfect for Chris Damos, expect no more than three innings. Um, he will have a quick hook, but the guy that to focus on is A.J. Causey because he will pitch the duration, the majority of the game on Friday. Great insight. Um, Florida State fans watching this lamenting the fact that they, too, are not hold Cam Leiter, uh, their number one Friday night starter, a uh, loss for the season. Uh, after the Clemson uh, series. So uh, crazy that both these teams don't have their studs, but yet somehow found a way to Omaha credit, obviously, to their uh, coaching staffs. Offensively, Florida State's been so fun to watch all year long, and Tennessee has outdone them in nearly every statistical category, which is crazy to say because Florida State's offense has been absolutely potent. I guess it all starts kind of with Christian Moore, but there's Billy Amick, Cal Stark, uh, Dalton Bargo, Dylan Dryling, all these guys have had multiple home runs in multiple games this year. Uh, just how ferocious has this lineup been? And, and the DH spot is another thing that Tony kind of likes to play game to game. What's the the genesis and the, the reasoning behind that, Eric? Well, reasoning, I have no clue, man. Your guess is good as mine. Nobody's taken off with that DH spot all year long. So it's literally, it's been like musical chairs, man. I mean, Reese Chapman gets the bulk of the looks, at least initially, and I mean, don't be shocked if, you know, Dalton Bargo or Reese Chapman, whoever's the DH on Friday, if they go 0 for 2, you know, and, and don't have very good at bats, Tony will pull them, put somebody else in. So maybe that has part of it as well. It's like they're they're competing for their job every single at bat, but whatever. I mean, it's been working, I guess, you know, from the big picture. Um, and, and a couple of guys you didn't even mention, man, and that's not like the pick on you, it's just to show how deadly this lineup is. I mean, Kavaris Tears, Dylan Dryling, they're going to be draft picks this summer. Blake Burke is an All-American. I mean, Tennessee has so many guys. And it starts with Christian Moore. He's one of the best in the country. Um, just a phenomenal season, 32 home runs. Leads the team with, you know, however many RBIs he has from the leadoff spot. Really, really good at bats. I mean, there's not a pitch that he can't hit. It starts with him. Then you go to Burke and then and Billy Amick and Dylan Dryling. And then you got a freshman in Dean Curley that hits seventh. And he's had a really, really good year. And um, Hunter Inslee, outfielder. Um you know, he's typically a bottom of the order guy, but the last month of the season he's been raking and he's hitting fifth right now. He's he's one of Tennessee's best hitters. And then Cal Stark has gotten so much pop in the bottom of the order at the number nine spot. So all this to say, Tennessee will go we'll have games and go through some mini slumps, obviously. Every team does. Uh, but this is the best hitting team in, in the nation on paper. And it's um there's a lot of good hitting teams, especially on this side of the bracket for sure. Um, on paper, Tennessee's the best, and um, you know we'll see if that's going to be enough. But it's it's got to be so daunting for an opposing pitcher. You know we we ask opposing um, you know coaches all the time. You know throughout this postseason run, like how challenging is this Tennessee lineup? You know this approach, and it's just at a loss for words because it's. I mean, Link Jarrett earlier today, you know, in the press conference, trying to compare the twenty twenty two lineup to this one, he was like, "Man, they're deadly." Um, and you know, credit to Josh Elin or Antonio Vitello for making it what it is. But it's deep. A lot of options, and um, it's it's been hitting on all cylinders so far this year, and we'll see if Tennessee can finish uh, that, that same way. Like I don't know what the magic number is if you're a Florida State fan. Like 
if Jamie Arnold gets you six innings and only allows two runs, are you excited? Is three runs too much? Uh, but obviously, two teams are supremely talented. But what you worry about if you're a Florida State fan is, is probably the bullpen. Not There's really no lead that makes you feel totally safe handing things over to the bullpen. That Not to say that Brennan Oxford, Joe Charles, uh, these guys aren't able to come in there and get you some outs. John Abraham, Connor Whitaker might have to be a guy that fills in as a stopgap if they don't um, – hold them off to like a, a 2-0 semifinal win. Uh, the outfield is something I mentioned to you on your podcast about Florida State. Offensively, those outfielders are terrific, but defensively, they're they're adequate. Uh, but with the way Tennessee swings the bat, you get worried about maybe some gap shots ending up uh, spiraling into more problems for them. What, what are the things for Tennessee that, that maybe keeps Vol fans up at night and they kind of are going to be worried about no matter what happens until they get that 27th out on Friday? Defense. Yeah, it's uh, it's improved in certain areas a lot from last year. Um, and when you sit back and think about Tennessee's team last year, I mean, they weren't bad at all. But in certain spots, you're like, man, that team made it all the way to Omaha. Because, I mean, Blake Burke was a horrendous first baseman last year. And, and he'll, he'll be the first to say it. I mean, he's he, he's done shows, you know, with our, with our website. And I'll be like, yeah, I mean, I was bad last year in the field. And he has transformed into a great defensive first baseman. Christian Moore, who is still – he's not a second baseman. He, you know, at the next level, he'll probably play corner outfield. Um, he still has some boneheaded plays at the Keystone every now and again. He had one the other night against Evansville, but he's improved a little bit as well. Um, Dean Curley's a true freshman playing shortstop. He's going to make an error every now and again. And Billy Amick, sometimes it's a ride over there at third base as he's, you know, playing defense full time for the first time in his career. So um, I, I would say defense for sure. Out, outfield defensively, I think they're pretty good. Kavaris Tears has a rocket arm in right field. Hunter Inslee is a great defensive center fielder. Um, Dylan Dryling again, um, you know, he'll continue to get better the more reps he gets. He'll get drafted this summer, but he's gotten better and left. So I think the defense in the outfield is pretty solid. Around the horn, they're fine. Like, I'm nitpicking here, but right. sometimes it is a little bit of a ride. And then, and then, you know, in the bullpen, Tennessee, it's like they don't pitch an awful lot of guys, but the guys they do are just so effective. Kirby Cannell can pitch every single game if you need him to. He's got a rubber arm. And this is his last ride. Nate Snead is so versatile. He can hit triple digits. Um, he's long relief. He can be a closer. Aaron Combs is a high velocity guy. Um, they, they, you know, they they kind of have used all those. And then again, AJ Causey's long relief, and he'll pitch a ton for Tennessee in, in Friday's game, I would imagine. So they don't have a whole lot of depth in the bullpen, but the guys they do have have been really, really good for Tennessee. But anytime, as you mentioned as well, like, you know, you're, you're deep into your bullpen, it's kind of like holding your breath at times. But I would say defense and, and the lack of depth in the bullpen is what worries Tennessee fans. But overall, it's 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 all been good enough so far. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, both fan bases are going to walk into this one supremely confident, and uh, one will walk into a nice Sunday 1-0 game. The other one's going to have to walk into an elimination game. That's what makes yep. this tournament – one of the best in the world. So we look forward to it Friday night, seven o'clock, Florida state taking on Tennessee and Omaha in the college world series opener. First one under link Jarrett uh, for the Knowles. Thanks so much to Eric Kane, Kaner from a uh, vol quest on the on three website. Uh, enjoy your weekend, man. Thanks for taking time out. Hey, appreciate you having me on. That's a wrap everybody. Uh, again, it was a short one. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, sorry again for all the commercial at the beginning of it. Uh, I think Jeff Cameron show will be going down one to three o'clock. So check that out. Not sure if we're having a watch along for the game, but I don't know. Tweet at me. I'll engage. Post a lot of thread over on the uh, FSU baseball forum. Maybe I'll be actually Iro probably be running it since he's actually in Omaha. But maybe I'll be running it remotely in Tallahassee. Hop into it. Let's talk about baseball. Let's talk about our feelings, our emotions, the things that we aspire to accomplish in life, the great things, and what it feels like when we come up short and why we get off, off the mat and try to keep pursuing it day after day. These are things that keep me up at night. Maybe I recorded this open at 1.30 in the morning. Who knows? That's a wrap. Thanks again for everybody for listening in. We'll be back next week. We'll talk about football, I promise. But hopefully we'll still be talking a lot about baseball. Uh, for Corin Aslan, it's been Wake Up War Champ presented by Vitamin Energy.